recognizing litigation abuse as a form of family violence, understanding the concept and the potential harm. Uh, and a number of people are indicating they don't have uh, volume. Imagine people's uh, um, audio. There we go. People have uh, cameras have been turned off, uh, but I hope everybody can uh, can hear me now. Uh, this webinar is uh, is uh, available through funding brought by the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, working in collaboration uh, with Western and with our Alliance of Canadian Research Centers on Gender Based Violence. Um, just a note about interpretation, we have uh, people following both in English and in French. Uh, if you want to look for your preferred language, if you click on the globe icon at the very bottom of your screen for interpretation, uh, you can choose English or French. Um, if you want to select the language of your slides, the slides are, will be moved forward both in English and in French, and you go to the top of your screen under view options, and you can click on either English or French slides. And also this webinar is being recorded, uh, so you'll be able to access uh, the website to listen to future recording or share that with colleagues if they weren't able to be uh, at this webinar today. Again, just to uh, just to be clear for those of you uh, not as familiar, look at look at your uh, the globe at the very bottom that says interpretation, and select your language. Um, you can also click on preferred audio language uh, for interpretation, and again go to the top of the screen for view options, uh, and click on French slides if you want to move from the English to the uh, to the French slides. So again, welcome to this webinar. Uh, originally, we had uh, uh, over 800 people register, and some may be registered as groups. So we thought it'd be helpful for our panelists to know where everyone's from. So on your screen, can you indicate um, the region that you're from, either in Canada or outside, um, or in the United States, or outside Canada and US. And can you also uh, scroll down to indicate uh, what profession uh, you identify with, whether you're here as a lawyer, judge, police, mental health professional, social services, survivor, or other, if you want to respond to those questions. And then we'll share the results. So we actually don't share your response on, uh, you should be able to share your response on screen on the poll. Um, you don't have to put it in the chat function. All participants are muted and the video is off for all participants. So you can see the results. So uh, over 60% of folks are from uh, Ontario and we're spread across uh, the whole country. And we can see that 21% uh, are from the US and 2% from outside Canada and the US. And in terms of profession, 22% uh, are lawyers, 13% mental health professionals, 23% social services, violence against women services, 32%, survivors, 9% of the participants, just to give us some sense. Thank you for responding to the poll. And again, just a reminder, and I should have said this earlier, all your cameras are off and are muted other than the speakers. If you have questions, uh, please put them, uh, into the Q&A box and we'll have time for questions at the end. And also at the end of the webinar, there'll be an evaluation form uh, that'll come up automatically in your browser. 
and you can complete it and we'll be able to send you a certificate of participation. And again, as indicated, the webinar is being recorded uh, together with the slide material and will be posted on the Family Violence Family Law website. Before we begin, begin, let's think about the traditional lands that you're currently situated on across the US and Canada and join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous peoples who care for these lands and in celebrating the continued strength and spirit of Indigenous peoples. The ongoing work to make the promise of truth and rec reconciliation real in our communities, and in particular to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across the country should inform our discussions in this webinar and beyond. Begin by introducing our first speaker, um, Nick Bala. Professor Bala has been at the Faculty of Law at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada since 1980, focusing his work on issues related to children and families involved in the justice system. He, is, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2013 and named a distinguished university professor at Queen's in 2019. And again, a more extensive uh, background is available on the site. Uh, Professor Bala, welcome. Thank you for being here and being part of this webinar. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to everyone who is attending. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Um, I'll be setting a context for the rest of the presentations, uh, focusing uh, particularly on the legal aspects or what the how this looks to a, a lawyer or a law professor. Um, litigation abuse is in some ways uh, as old as the justice system, but it's a largely a relatively recent way of thinking about what is going on in the justice system. And in particular, in the family justice system, uh, the intent of the system is partly to prove certain things and particularly in regard to children to establish their best interests. Um, but in some cases it is abused by uh, one or both parties uh, in a way that is inappropriate and unfair. And certainly in the context of the discussion today can exacerbate the effects of family violence. Uh, one of the things about litigation abuse is that it is difficult to identify often. Um, it is difficult in some ways to define. There are a range of definitions. Uh, but it is essentially a, an abuse of the litigation process that causes psychological uh, harm to the other party and that is in some ways misusing the system. One of the reasons that it's difficult to identify is that the process, the, the, the family justice process, both Canada and the United States is an adversarial process with the judge, at least in theory, being a neutral arbiter, uh, someone who's also trying to promote the best interest of the child, but is not intended to uh, be an investigator and may not know all the facts of what's actually going on. When we think about litigation abuse, one way of uh, thinking about it is what, what is the intent of the person who is abusing the system? Um, and in some cases, particularly those that we'll be focusing on today, it may be a, an aspect of gaining or continuing to have psychological control over the other party, it may also be with the intent of gaining some advantage, whether it's economic, uh, maybe reduced child support, more time with the children than otherwise justified by wearing the other party down uh, in order to achieve an unfair settlement or to achieve an unfair advantage in the court process. And certainly some perpetrators are very conscious of what it is that they're doing. Uh, in other cases, it may have the effect of uh, being litigation abuse and inappropriate, but they may not fully appreciate the context of their conduct. Um, from a psychological perspective, many of those who may be engaging in litigation abuse probably have personality disorders of some kind, so that may distort their understanding and perception. They may, may honestly believe they're acting fairly or they may not, but their ultimate intent is not determinative. Certainly one of the focuses, especially in today's program, is what is the experience 
a victim of the abuse? Uh, and what is the effect of the conduct on the position that is taken in the context of litigation? Um, when we think of litigation abuse, it can arise in different legal contexts, in the criminal context. Uh, it may be in the form of malicious, unfounded reports to the police that the other party has been abusing children. Um, it may and sometimes occurs now in the form of one party phoning the police and saying, my children are with the other party. Uh, I'm concerned I haven't heard from them or whatever. Could you please go and perform a wellness check? And the issue of wellness checks by police is itself controversial um, and particularly in the context of a parental separation. Overlapping with the criminal context is the child protection context where uh, the abuse may be in the form of systemic abuse, may be in the form of malicious unfounded reports to child protection services to go and investigate, uh, may result in suspension of contact with the child for a period of time. Um, and, and certainly causes stress. Our focus today, I think, is primarily on litigation abuse in the family context, the family justice system, family court context. And when thinking about uh, litigation abuse in the family context, and there are many definitions of this, um, and I think uh, uh, there, is, there, are, there are materials in the, the center, I think it's, uh, provide a very good uh, brief on uh, litigation abuse that has more detail, but one aspect of it might be making claims that are unfounded without a legal or factual basis. Um, sometimes this is in the form of making uh, factual claims. Sometimes it is uh, adding a claim that uh, they've been defamed, which adds the complexity of litigation process. Another aspect might be uh, Seeking, a, seeking to postpone the resolution of a case, causing the other party added stress and expense. Sometimes what occurs is that one party will be making dishonest statements, not only about the other party, but about their lawyer. Um, sometimes this will be in the form of complaints, perhaps to the law society, uh, trying to undermine the relationship of a victim of abuse with their lawyer. Oh, your lawyer's an idiot. Uh, you don't need a lawyer. Uh, uh, I'm better than your lawyer and so on. Um, one aspect of the, of the family justice process is that people who are litigants are required to disclose their financial position, uh, their income and assets to promote a, a speedy resolution of cases. Uh, an abuser may refuse to provide that information or may be dishonest about providing it. A range of violation of court orders can be um, a form of uh, litigation abuse contempt may result in contempt of court again, slowing down the process, frustrating people, uh, endangering children. Uh, one another form of litigation abuse is uh, after a decision is made to immediately start appealing it um, or to seek a review. And cases of litigation abuse can go on literally for decade or a decade. There are cases that have gone on with one part of the abuser continually seeking uh, abuse, seeking uh, reviews without any basis for that. Um, certainly making, again, unfounded complaints about the other party, about the mental health professionals involved, about the judge, again, slowing down the process, adding to the stress, adding to the uncertainty. A key part of the family justice system in Canada is parties are encouraged or even required to make reasonable offers to settle, ones that would be consistent with a court outcome, a form of litigation abuse is to either refuse to make an offer or to refuse to accept a reasonable offer, again, adding to stress uh, and expense. In some cases, and there are certainly many people who can't afford a lawyer, but there are others who, who can't afford, who are able to afford a lawyer, but choose to be self-represented, really, for example, to have the opportunity to cross-examine their former spouse. And as I'm describing this in many of the cases, these could be a man who is abusing a woman um, in the litigation process, as I'll point out, um, there's also litigation abuse by females of their male partners or indeed in same sex relationships. Another <clears throat> dimension of litigation may be abuse, threats, comments that are made outside the court but uh, room, but in the courthouse, again, 
abusing the litigation process, acting in an unfair and inappropriate way. When thinking about litigation abuse from a certain perspective, um, and I'm privileged to really in part inspired by Peter, uh, who raised some question, you know, how do we know the breakdown of fathers and mothers and opposite sex relationships who engage in litigation abuse? And the answer is we don't. There's actually research both about men who've been victims of litigation abuse by their female partners, former female partners, and mothers who are victims of litigation abuse by fathers. I think it's clear that both parents, uh, either parent, and sometimes actually both parents in a case are engaging in litigation abuse, can go engage in litigation abuse. Um, I think that the, certainly that the view to this point has been that, that uh, mothers are more likely to be the victims, but it's still a question that we're researching. Um, I think a particular focus though, particularly today is um, when there has been violence, physical violence, particularly coercive controlling during the relationship and there is litigation abuse perpetrated by the male after the end of that relationship. As I say, there are other situations um, where women are acting inappropriately in the litigation context, but the exacerbation of course of control that, that has gone on during the relationship after the end of the relationship by uh, misuse of the court process can be extremely stressful and detraumatic for victims. Um, when thinking about, so how can the justice system respond? And it's not just the justice system, not just law, uh, social service workers, others, victim support workers, domestic violence workers, how can they support victims going through this, particularly victims of uh, domestic violence? And certainly from a systemic point of view, I think one of the best things that can be done is if there is single judge case management, which is something that we have in some courts in Ontario, particularly uh, the Ontario Court of Justice, um, but we don't always have it. And so sometimes there are many different judges involved in a case and it takes time for a judge to really ascertain what's going on. Clearly if litigation abuse or anything is alleged, the person who's alleging it has an onus of proof, has the obligation to bring forward evidence to support it. One of the things that I think is significant uh, now has been that recently courts have recognized the Supreme Court of Canada, among others, in the uh, Baron Gett case, has recognized that litigation abuse in itself, inappropriate conduct, abusive conduct in the court process and the filing of documents in defiance of court orders can be a factor in making decisions about parenting arrangements, custody, what we used to call custody access or allowing a victim of relocation to uh, relocate, a victim of, of violence to relocate. So it's a best interest factor. Another uh, aspect to the legal responses and a common one in Canada, less so in the United States, is that a victim of litigation abuse may be getting, uh, the fact that they're a victim of litigation abuse, that reasonable settlement offers have been rejected, uh, may be the basis for an award of what we call cost. That is say they may be indemnified for their legal fees, either in part or in total. One of the ideas to help promote this is to have uh, more, again, if there's single judge case management, to have judges more uh, frequently, more regularly, more at, a, at an earlier stage, ordering that their costs to, to give the abuser a message that their conduct, his conduct is unacceptable. Uh, there are situations where uh, a litigation abuse may result in an application for contempt, which could result in a fine or even a jail sentence, or perhaps more commonly uh, suspending the right to participate in the family justice process, striking pleadings and so on. There have been cases where um, the, the conduct, the abuse of conduct relates to the litigation process, but may in itself be outside the court itself. There may be a court order to comply or to cease that kind of conduct, sending of emails, harassing emails uh, to the other party or to the lawyers or others. Um, there is a process also for having someone who's been an abusive litigant declared a vexatious litigant, um, which would restrict their access to the courts. The cases where we've had this done have been pretty extreme and as I say, they've often gone on for years. 
Um, so this is certainly a, a, a challenging issue uh, for um, those who are working with victims in different contexts. One of the things that I think, uh, of course, for everyone who's involved, but particularly those who may not be as familiar with the family justice system, is to recognize that litigation is always stressful. Um, and particularly in the context of family litigation, uh, there is tremendous uncertainty. What's the outcome going to be? How much will this cost? Uh, and a recognition that uh, the family justice process inevitably involves loss of control, a sense of being judged by the judge for one's conduct as a parent. Um, so it is stressful um, and people need to be aware of that. And I should say that's certainly why many cases, most cases, not those involving significant family violence, but if there's not been significant violence, uh, there aren't issues like mental health or substance abuse, it's generally preferable for people to settle cases that they maintain that control, they reduce their costs, and they work on having a stronger relationship with the other parent. They're gonna have to continue to co-parent. But if there has been abuse, it may be necessary to litigate, to go to court, to get a court order to protect the victim and the children, um, and certainly to uh, recognize the stress that if a person is litigating, recognize the stress that they're experiencing and recognize that there may be a potential not only for psychological uh, effects, financial effects, but also uh, some cases where there's physical violence and threats. Um, on the one side of this, while supporting victims uh, through the process and encouraging them if they've been victims of family violence, to assert their rights to get the protection of the courts, not to settle in a way that would be unfair, uh, give them less than they're entitled to that might endanger the safety of their children. But a real challenge is also to maintain respect for client agency. If a client says, yes, I've been a victim of abuse, but I really want to settle, I think on a certain level that has to be um, recognized and supported. It's also important uh, for those who are uh, lawyers for victims uh, who are victims of family violence, victims of litigation abuse to recognize that those lawyers themselves often need support. They may be threatened, they may be harassed themselves. Uh, those who engage in litigation abuse may be posting malicious and unfounded reviews on Google or whatever to try to ruin the reputation of the lawyer and to cause psychological tension, maybe making unfounded complaints to the law side and so on. So I want to thank you for your attention uh, and I'm going to turn this back to Peter. Okay, thank you uh, Professor Bell and we'll, we'll be back uh, for questions at the end. I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor Ellen Mikowski. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development. Uh, her interests are, include promoting well-being of underserved populations and also has done a lot of research related to intimate partner violence. And we called on her today in particular for her work in trying to better define the concept of litigation abuse. And uh, she has a new publication out and uh, I'll turn it over to her for her discuss her work in this area. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for everyone attending online. So I will talk about my research on a continuation of course of control and specifically our efforts to develop the legal abuse scale. And I would like to acknowledge my co-author Lisa Goodman, who co-authored a number of the studies we'll be referencing today, as well as the many community partners, experts who we consulted with throughout our research process, and the survivors who shared their experiences in our studies. We know that rates of intimate partner violence are quite high globally, as well as here in North America. Rates are high in the United States, where the study that I will be referencing was conducted, as well as here in Canada. And for those leaving abusive partners, separation entails a number of risks and challenges. It's really a quite vulnerable time. It has been well established that those leaving an abusive relationship 
face an increased risk of physical violence and homicide, as well as job instability oftentimes and housing instability. Many may face limited access to financial resources. And while dealing with all of these risks and stressors, many are also contending with the mental health consequences of the abuse. This period can be even more challenging for those who are parents who may may have to know, as well as facing the person who abused them and sometimes also abused their children through post-separation legal processes. A few years ago, when my co-author and I started to conduct this research, there had been a number of qualitative studies looking at mothers who had experienced abuse in relationships and had entered into custody processes. And mothers were reporting very negative experiences in family court. And so we wanted to learn a bit more about what these mothers had to say about their experiences. What we found through our work was that coercive control was really central to understanding this process. Coercive control is a repeated and ongoing pattern of behaviors that one party in a relationship attempts uh, to use to gain power and control over another. It might include ongoing surveillance and monitoring of one's par partner. It might include attempts to deplete their social and economic resources. So disrupting their ability to hold a job or socially isolate them. It does not always entail physical violence. It often entails frequent threats of physical violence and other harms and might include episodes of physical violence. Sometimes these episodes are infrequent. Nonetheless, this dynamic can be profoundly psychologically damaging. A really helpful resource on learning more about trauma and course of control is Judith Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery. And in this book, Herman likens the experience of being a survivor of course of control to that of being a prisoner of war. She describes just how profoundly distressing this experience can be. By its very definition, course of control involves one party leveraging their social power over another. Evan Stark is a foundational thinker in this area. And Evan Stark really focused on course of control as an extension of gendered inequality in his work on heterosexual relationships. Subsequent work that has also looked at couples' experiences in same-sex relationships has supported that understanding the intersectional identities of the parties and the sources of power are really important to understanding this experience of course of control and specifically how abuse manifests in the relationship, how it's experienced by the person who is being victimized and the social responses from outsiders. In our work, looking at mother's experiences in abusive relationships, who were leaving abusive relationships, we found that course of control could be extended into post-separation legal processes. That's legal abuse. We conceptualize legal abuse as an extended form of abuse. I'll never forget the mother who I interviewed and sat down with, who had been experiencing legal abuse for multiple years after her attempt to leave a relationship with an abusive ex-partner. She really felt that courts had to start identifying course of control. She said that's been such an incredible component and course of control plays out in the courtroom by excessive litigation, constant abuse. It shouldn't be tolerated in a court of law. It has no place in a court of law. Since publishing this qualitative study, we 
did some subsequent work where we aimed to develop a measure of legal abuse. We developed survey items from this prior qualitative study based on interviews with 19 family court involved survivors who were mothers. We also reviewed existing qualitative research on this topic. And we consulted with disciplinary experts on this topic. So these were practitioners from a number of different disciplines, as well as researchers who were legal scholars and social scientists. From this process, we developed 27 survey items to try to capture this concept. And we piloted these items and translated them into Spanish. We then administered them to 222 court-involved survivors who were mothers. What we found is that legal abuse could manifest in a variety of different ways. Participants and experts described how partners who use this form of abuse can threaten and attempt to take custody. And often this was not motivated out of a desire to be with one's children, but instead motivated by a desire to cause distress to the other party. We also found that partners who use this form of abuse can threaten or attempt to get unsafe access to children. And for those who we spoke to who had experienced violence or whose children had experienced violence, these threats and attempts were profoundly distressing. Experts who we spoke to and participants who we spoke to also described how abusive ex-partners used in-person proceedings to cause distress. They would repeatedly file motions so that they had to confront one another face-to-face -face in court, even when there was a no-contract restraining order in place. Or an abusive ex-partner would make efforts to prolong the court proceedings, sometimes for multiple years, as Professor Bala noted. Experts and participants also described how partners who use this form of abuse can distort information or lie in proceedings, often to discredit the other parent's parenting ability. They also described how partners could threaten or actually withhold financial support, such as child support, and threaten or actually attempt to take control of shared assets. Our efforts resulted in a 14 item questionnaire that is available open access and it has two subscales. One we titled harm to self or motherhood and one harm to finances. Having this quantitative measure of legal abuse enabled us to explore whether there was a quantitative association between legal abuse and worsened mental health. And this information is currently under review. Um, but what we found is that legal abuse was indeed associated with elevated symptoms of post-traumatic stress and elevated symptoms of depression, and that these associations stood even after accounting for prior sexual, psychological, and physical abuse in the relationship. We also collected qualitative open-ended responses from the survey that we ran. And what we found was that mothers who responded to our survey really described profound psychological, economic, and work-related harms that resulted from legal abuse. For example, one participant who responded shared I had a stress-related heart attack and have permanent heart damage. Generally, the constant what will happen next, he cannot ever leave me alone, alone hanging over my head weighs on me. Another described, I have been diagnosed with PTSD and severe anxiety with panic attacks from the abusive marriage and the continuing custody battle. I am now disabled from PTSD. Our findings support that legal abuse appears to be quite harmful to mothers who are separating from abusive partners, and that it really prevents survivors from moving on after abusive relationships. Of course, like any piece of research, this research has limitations. 
The survey that we developed is a self-report survey, and we are not advocating its use as a standalone measure in assessment. Um, and certainly, we welcome future efforts to refine um, and continue to work on efforts to measure this concept. Our findings support the need for prevention efforts and the critical need for education and ongoing training on course of control for all professionals who work with survivors and their families in this process. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Kukowski, for that presentation. Um, I think you've heard from Professor Bala and now Professor Kukowski about some of the thinking and the research. We thought it was important in this seminar to hear directly from someone who has lived through this experience. And with that in mind, I want to introduce uh, uh, Jared to you. Uh, Jared uh, has lived experience as a child whose life was engulfed in the family justice system for many years. And uh, as a young adult, he's uh, become a strong advocate for youth. He's volunteered in various advisory boards, spoken at many conferences, and made presentations to audiences across the country in the legal system. He's aided in the redesign of the BC online parenting after separation course. And he's currently a student at the University of British Columbia in philosophy and psychology and has a very busy schedule, but I'm glad we're able to get him to come in today. Jared, we're looking forward to hearing your comments on, on your lived experience. Uh, thank you, Peter, and hello, everyone. Um, I actually wanted to start with an apology for two reasons. One, because I'm going to be speaking a little bit quickly to get through enough for you all, but also uh, just because I'm going to be sharing quite a bit of personal information, I want to make sure that you know it is not my goal to trauma bomb you. I'm just hoping that you'll see some similarities to what has already been discussed today, or just see how coercive control can manifest through the eyes of a child, uh, and just relate to some things, perhaps if you've been through it yourself. So with that in mind, I'm going to begin with a brief overview of my family's legal history and then go more in depth afterwards. So to start, thankfully, my parents have officially gone almost three years without any legal battles. But prior to three years ago, my parents actually fought in court for 19 years straight. They had eight full trials, a dozen case conferences and well over 150 court appearances. And this on its own should be, you know, it should raise a couple red flags. But what's even more absurd is that my parents were only together for about five months, yet five months of a bad relationship resulted in 20 years of court. Um, during those few months when my parents were together, my mother was abused physically, financially, sexually, emotionally, and she managed to get out of that situation when she was pregnant with me. Um, there was no like divorce. There were no property issues to figure out. There were no, um, no, there was no spousal support. So what can my parents have fought, possibly fought about in court for 20 years? It turns out everything. Their initial cases were about some complicated medical stuff with me, but then uh, it was also about custody access and parenting time with me. That quickly devolved into full on accusations of unfit parenting alienation, domestic abuse, child abuse, there's blackmail involved, child support and finances were constantly being brought up, there's defamation, there was even tax fraud and in in income fraud, uh, everything, it kept ramping up as it went on. And to top it off, my father was also going through um, his second divorce early on in my life, which resulted with another woman, which resulted in more court battles with other parties. So multiple families were being brought in, multiple ex-wives and ex-girlfriends were being brought in to testify in each other's trials, and it was just this huge mess. Now, despite all of this, I actually didn't see the court until I was about 15 years old because I was physically kept out of everything. But that doesn't mean that it didn't affect me. It was always present. And when I was 13, I made the decision to stop speaking to my father, hoping that I could escape it all. Um, unfortunately, this actually made things worse for a while. And when I was 15, I began supporting my mother in the legal proceedings, showing up to court, taking part as much as I could. And then court continued for another four to five years uh, before coming to an end in 2020. Okay, now that that's out of the way, it should be clear 
from that overview I just shared, that court spiraled out of control. And as the 20 years of fighting progressed, there was more and more built up resentment between all the parties. Without a doubt, we all felt uh, wronged by one another. And my father possibly felt betrayed by us. And thus he turned the legal system into a tool for punishing us. So I now want to use or move on to how this was done. I'm going to start with home life, and then I'm going to move on to examples of abusive process afterwards. So very generally, the legal system was used to overwhelm and compromise my mother's entire life, as well as my own, um, and to turn me against my mother. So even when I was two or three years old, we would have family friends come over and they would take notes. They would talk to me. They would observe my mother and I playing and then they would leave never to be seen again. And later in life, I felt these were not family friends, but these are actually specialists evaluating my relationship with my mother because she had been accused of unfit parenting and alienation. Now, also, starting from a young age, my father would make sure to tell me exactly how much money he was forced to give my mother every month. He would tell me that she was constantly taking him back to court for more money. Um, and he would tell me that she was wasting all this money on herself. Now, it turns out what my father was talking about in this scenario was child support. And um, in fact, he was the one taking my mother back to court to try and pay less. My mother was just responding to it. But nevertheless, my father always framed it like she was the one responsible for court. He blamed her for court, uh, would badmouth her, call her mentally ill, get his family to badmouth her even, et cetera. And more than that, early in my life, my father would, uh, he would ask me questions about my mother, like seemingly simple stuff. You know, how was her work? Who was she spending time with? How much time? When? Where? Why? And later in life, I found out these things that I was telling him would end up in court. For example, if I had told him that my mother's boyfriend had been spending time with us, well, my father would take that to court and say, my mother's now dual income, so he doesn't need to pay so much in child support. Uh, absolutely everything appeared as evidence in court, as was mentioned earlier, even the most absurd stuff, like how much time my mother was spending breastfeeding me or what name was on my lunchbox that I went to school. My father would... Um, say that my mother was breastfeeding me too much. So it was creating an unhealthy attachment and alienating me from him or that uh, my mother's last name being on my lunchbox was alienating me from him because it wasn't his name, etc. Everything was brought in as evidence in court. It was overwhelming. A lot of this stuff was personal and embarrassing and didn't belong in court. Regardless, he did it anyway. And in this kind of situation, my mother quickly learned that she had to start monitoring everything that she did, everything she said, everywhere she went, everyone she was with in case it was used against her in court. And this evidently had a huge impact on me since I was living with her while she was going through all this stress. But more than that, I would always be told by my father what I wasn't allowed to say to my mother. I was told by my mother what I wasn't allowed to say to my father. And having to monitor everything I did as a child, uh, I became extremely anxious, angry, and confused. I was constantly hearing one thing from one side of the family, another thing from the other side. I was constantly in therapy. I never knew who to trust and what was true. And when I was 13, like I said, I became so sick of it all. And I had to stop speaking to my father altogether. You can't have a relationship with someone when you're constantly scared about what you can say to them. When everything you do say gets used against you in court or used against your mother in court or thrown back at you, my father was very meticulous and manipulative and I needed out. Now this is where it kind of gets juicy, a little bit more court stuff. Uh, when I did stop seeing my father, as I mentioned earlier though, everything actually got worse. He continued to make court an ever-present cause of stress in my life as well as my mother's and he would use threats and misinformation about court to try and get me to see him. So he would often confuse me with court by falsely quoting court orders, telling me that my interpretations of court orders were wrong. He would tell me that I had to do whatever he said, that it was against the law to not talk to him, that I was being immature and selfish for not seeing him, uh, that I needed therapy and he would pay for the therapy in order to fix me. Uh, and then if I still didn't agree to see him, he would just threaten us with court. So he thus shifted the responsibility and blame of court onto us if I didn't see him, well, then he would say he would have no choice but to take my mother back to court and he would have no choice but to stop paying child support. Um, he got blamed for absolutely everything. At one point, he, he, he actually had a heart attack and his family accused me of having blame. Or, sorry, they blamed me for having caused his heart attack. Uh, yeah, we got we got accused of absolutely everything and blamed for everything. And um, eventually I had to block 
his entire family and him on social media. Uh, but then I started receiving letters in the mail saying how horrible of a son I was. And I was immature and selfish and I owed my father and couldn't ask for a better father, etc. It just, it never stopped is the point. Uh, that being said, my father was right about one thing. There was a court order that did force me to have some sort of communication with him. And I did this via email. Um, but whenever I did this, I kept it to a minimum. I always reviewed court documents and I went through a communication history to make sure everything that I said was accurate. So I didn't contradict myself or give him fuel to be used in court uh, because stuff, like I said, would often be thrown back at me, whatever I said. So my friends would often ask me why I wasn't spending time with them. And there I'd be just meticulously crafting emails and playing mind games with my own father because I was forced to for the courts. Um, court compromised every aspect of our lives. Like I said, we spent every waking moment preparing for it. We couldn't get away from it. And that's how it can affect home life. So I now want to move away from home life and shift my focus to abuse of process. Financial abuse is a huge one in the legal system, as is being able to continuously take someone back to court. Um, those two issues are obviously linked. When I was very young, my father left a voicemail on my mother's answering machine saying that he was going to continuously take her back to court until she was mentally and financially exhausted, which is exactly what he did. Out of the eight trials that my family had, seven of them were initiated by my father, along with the countless other times that we didn't even make it to court. So one of the things that my father would do is he would often cancel a court appearance at the last minute. Uh, and whenever he did this, my mother would have to take time off work, cancel her clients, rearrange them, figure out childcare for me, and then spend weeks preparing court documents by herself, essentially for nothing. Uh, another thing that he would try to do is try and get my mother to think that a court appearance had been canceled so that she wouldn't show up to court and then she would be held in contempt of court. And because of these sharp practices, I had to watch my mother's days and nights disappear along with her life savings as she was constantly preparing for court. Um, my father also prepared, or he also engaged in other sharp practices. So I had therapists, teachers, daycare providers, family friends who were all threatened with court by my father. My mother had her family or her friends and our family were threatened with court. If they tried to help, her doctors even received fake subpoenas that told them to appear on court on weekends or on holidays. And this was stressful for everyone involved. This made many people scared to be around us. Um, he, my father did what he promised in financially and uh, psychologically exhausting my mother. But more than that, he he isolated us. Um, I had school counselors give up information about my life in fear of being sued. I had therapists drop me and refuse to see me in fear of being sued. We felt like we couldn't trust anybody. We felt like nobody understood the stress that we were going through. People didn't want to be around us because of all the stress we were going through. So we were isolated both because people didn't want to be around us and because they were just threatened with court if they tried to help. Um, as for more examples, my mother would always be served court documents on holidays or a few days going or before going on holidays so that she either couldn't respond in time or she would have to worry about court the entire that time that we were away on holidays so this meant that we never got any break from court it was constantly ongoing and my father always knew when we were going on holidays because it was in a court order that we had to inform him of it so he knew what he was doing uh regardless my mother would also be served court documents at her work which would cause a scene at her work uh, or as for my favorite example, we came home on my 19th birthday to court documents lying across the front door, which included an affidavit that belittled me, talked about how I was a bad student, how I'd never be successful, how I'd never get into the school uh, I wanted so he didn't have to keep paying child support um, and supporting me. And this essentially ruined my 19th birthday. I only have a few more minutes. Uh, so there are many more examples that I could give, but uh, I have to mention one last important thing. In British Columbia, where I am, you're not guaranteed to have the same judge throughout an entire case. So uh, one thing that my father would do is my, my, he would take advantage of the fact that often when we did go to court, we would get a new judge who didn't know our family's legal history, and he would just resubmit court documents over and over and over again until he got a judge that perhaps would help things go in his favor. And a personal example of this that has become practically a staple of my life story, I think Peter really wanted me to talk about it when we talked about this, or me taking part in this, um, was when I was 15, I spoke up in a case conference against my father. 
And I was not supposed to speak during this case conference, but I did so anyway. My parents and a judge were present and I spoke against my father, like I said, for 50 minutes. And the judge sat there and listened to me speak for 50 minutes without interruption. And at the end of it, she praised me for being able to do that. And then she told me that I was to take part in all legal proceedings from that point on and be heard because my story needed to be heard by judges and everyone. And she even got upset with my father at a few times or a few moments for speaking out of turn and even defended me when he tried to argue against me. And my father obviously didn't like this very much. And luckily for him, nothing ever came of it. The next time we appeared in court, it was a different judge. And that judge said that I shouldn't be there. They said that my involvement was inappropriate and I was told to wait outside. Also in that case conference, the judge served my mother with a new affidavit that my father had just submitted like the day before, uh, giving my mother 10 minutes to read it before they started discussing it. She also admitted that she knew nothing about my family's legal history and hadn't even read my mother's affidavit. Thus, my mother was forced to be alone in a room with her abuser and a judge who hadn't read her side of the story discussing an affidavit that she hadn't she hadn't prepared a response to. And I'm not blaming the judge for what happened here. There's no way that she could have known what was going on. But it is still true that my father would often just resubmit court documents, uh, try and reset court over and over again until things went in his favor, cancel appearances, et cetera, all this stuff. So to wrap everything up, my entire life essentially felt like one big court case. If someone is motivated enough and has the means to keep taking you back to court, there's nothing that you, you can really do about it. Even when court proceedings were in our favor, my father just wouldn't follow court orders. And then we were too scared to uh, hold him accountable for this because uh, that would mean we'd have to open up the floodgates to more court. And eventually you just learn that it's helpless. You learn that you can't afford it. You don't want to be stuck in it anymore. So you just allow it to happen. And in our last case, we actually just settled and allowed my father to have whatever he wanted, really, hoping that it would end. So far, it has, luckily. Um, but to this day, my mother still struggles with PTSD. And although I don't have full-on PTSD, I still struggle with my self-image, my insecurities, my overthinking everything, thinking everything I say is going to be used against me, etc. We haven't had a court battle in almost three years, but there is always that fear that we're going to get taken back or that something is already in the works to take us back. And that fear doesn't ever go away. So thank you. Jared, thank you for your courage and in, in sharing your story. And uh, for the participants, I should indicate that I, I watched Jared do a presentation with uh, for the young people at a judges conference in Quebec City. And both he and his uh, colleagues got a standing ovation from the judges just for speaking so forcefully about their experience. And, and sometimes we miss the, uh, the lived experience of young people who are in the system and really uh, don't have a voice. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Justice Maria uh, Saravar. She comes to us from the Ontario Court of Justice in Toronto, the Family and Youth Court. She graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School in 2006 and was admitted to the bar in 2007. Prior to appointment as a judge in 2018, she ran her own practice that focused on family and, and employment law. She was also worked as an agent for the Office of the Children's Lawyer and uh, was duty counsel on, uh, on many occasions. Uh, Justice Servar, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today and I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, buddy. It's such a pleasure to be here. Unlike in the before we go to conferences and we'd all be in the same room, we'd have an opportunity to speak. Um, and always have a sense of sort of who's there and what's going to happen. But today, um, I'm hearing a lot of this for the first time as you're hearing it, and Jared in particular. Uh, I'd, I'd never heard his presentation or his story. And I can tell you that Jared is the reason many of us do this work. Jared and all the children that are like Jared that are, that are forced to um, suffer the consequences of family court, uh, family violence, all over the province every day are the reason we get out of bed and we do our work the way that we do it. I had wanted to start my remarks before uh, without expecting that I'd be as moved as I was uh, by that presentation. So I'm really just buying time to be able to pull myself together. 
um, I wanted to start with just sort of talking about why all this matters, because this is really just the beginning of a conversation. Is my everything as I'm reading the questions that are coming up throughout the presentations. There's so much to discuss um, that we obviously can't cover it today. So I'm hoping that uh, this is just the beginning of a discussion. Um, and I started my notes indicating that I wanted to talk about and ground this in why, why does it matter? We, we've heard from the other speakers about the impact it has on the victim and in, in a litigation situation, it would be one of the parents, um, the, the strain and the drain on court resources. Um, and as a judge in family court, for me, it's all those things, but it's also the child. It's the child. I am mandated by the legislation to consider the best interest of the child. And part of that is considering the impact, the existence of, and the impact of family violence. And recent changes in Ontario and in Canada under the Divorce Act talk specifically about coercive control. And the legislation in Ontario, the Children's Law Reform Act, defines what family violence is and specifically states that it includes coercion and control. It doesn't have to rise to the level of being a criminal offense. It doesn't have to be um, the sort of what we all kind of know to be violence, where there's actually physical assault, um, but it can take many forms. And it matters because it has such an impact on the family going forward. It can have such an impact on the outcomes. And from my perspective, most importantly, it's the impact that it has on the children. When, from my perspective, what it might look like in the absence of a situation where there was an assault, there were criminal charges, I also sit in what we call the integrated domestic violence court. So where there are criminal charges and a family proceeding going on at the same time, those cases are case managed by myself and another judge in a different court where I'm dealing with the adult criminal charges as well as the family proceedings. And so that allows me as a case management judge to manage some of these negative consequences or potential dynamic um, that might result from such a situation. But I say again, those are the obvious cases, right? I also have other cases that are in the regular stream, but the behavior is so, extreme is not quite the right word, but it's so obvious. So I'll give you a, a simple example. I think it was my third day as a judge. Um, the, I had read the, the material and mother alleged that father was abusive and violent, but she'd never reported it because she was afraid and he denies it. He said, if I assaulted her, if I was violent, she would have reported it. Seven minutes into the conference, she, her lawyer says something he doesn't like. He stands up and he lunges towards her across the table. The rest is a bit of a blur because the clerk pushed the emergency button and there were police officers in the courtroom. So those are the clear cases. But equally damaging cases that are less clear are these types of cases that we're talking about today where you're using the court system to continue um, that pattern of behavior. And so from my perspective, what it would look like is I would see it in the pleading. So for example, the documents that start the application in, in our jurisdiction, it's an application. And people just sometimes write the most foul things and unrelated to the relief they're seeking. Even, even for somebody who isn't necessarily a lawyer or didn't get any assistance, it's clear that they are trying to shame the other side. They are trying to belittle the other side. They are trying to persuade anybody who comes into contact with them that this is a bad person. So it's, that's usually um, a, a sign because you can't acknowledge any good in somebody with whom you had a child. You, everything is negative and you speak in absolutes. The other is in court, they tend to, when we were in person, they would speak to the other person, never less to the court, they would get agitated and constantly directing comments at that other person. Even if it wasn't insulting, it's just I notice an inability to regulate when that person is around and, in, and, and easily um, going sort of from zero to 100. Another is, as, as was already described, multiple motions and multiple proceedings and not following court orders when things aren't going their way. The challenge in, in identifying it clearly though is because sometimes this subtle problematic behavior or at least what starts out as subtle can be caused by a number of things. So when you think about it, you're in family court. Some stranger, me, is gonna make decisions about your family. 
your family's broken down, you're afraid, you don't know if you'll, if you'll have the money you need to make ends meet, you don't know where your children will be, people are not, it's not their best day. You see people on their worst day and sometimes there is some negative behavior that isn't necessarily, um, it, that isn't necessarily the type of concerning behavior we're talking about. It's inappropriate, but it isn't necessarily that. It can also be some mental health issues. There could also be substance abuse issues and personality disorders. So we have to sort of identify or at least try to identify what's driving it so that you can figure out how to solve it. For example, if I continuously made cost orders against a party because of their behavior, but they're struggling with a mental health issue, that does nothing for the underlying cause of the behavior and it won't change it. I'm having trouble reading my writing, bear with me for a second. And so the question then is, so what, what do we do? What do we do about it? Um, as Professor Bala talked about, single judge case management is what we have in Toronto where I sit. And so what that means is in our jurisdiction, you start your application for child support, decision-making, all the things related to family breakdown. The other side answers. Then you have to go through a series of conferences because we're trying to narrow the issue, trying to get you to settle. We don't want you to go to court. We know that the outcomes are better when people have a say in the ultimate solution. So you're forced to attend these conferences. And when you have a single judge who attend, who you have to appear before at every conference, it makes it easier to manage this problematic behavior. So for example, I regularly tell people, if I see something in that original application that I think is inappropriate, as abusive, as degrading, as disrespectful, as unproductive, I will tell them. I will tell them I don't want to see it again. We come back with a brief. I don't want people rehashing what happened in 1982 and and how you thought she was, you know, how one party thinks that the other was cheating on them with the with whomever. I, there's no need to rehash any of that. So I'm very directive and very focused on the issues. And when people, it's an indication that this is the problematic behavior we're dealing with. And so the single judge case management model allows one judge who knows your family and who's also an expert in family law. That's what they call us. I guess that's debatable, but expert in the sense that this is what we do. This is our day job. This is where we practice. Um, for myself as a lawyer, I represented all sorts of clients in family court. I was a children's lawyer. I've seen all these issues. I've tended to all sorts of education. We get specific education for family law issues, including family violence, including alienation and difficult litigants and litigants that aren't represented constantly twice a year we go to family specific training for four days and then another time of year it's more general plus we're allowed to take other training so we're constantly learning we're constantly reading um, trying to understand because ultimately we have a responsibility to make decisions uh, for families that are unable to make those decisions for themselves that come to see us on their worst day uh, and for children, who have to live with the consequences of the process and the orders that we make. Another tool um, that I, I find is helpful is my ability to reject or accept offers. So I beg your pardon, settlements. So sometimes what happens is parties come to an agreement, they write something up and then they say, your honor, we've settled it. You don't need to worry about that. And then they hand it up and they want me to make it an order. So they say, can you endorse it? I would say order to go in accordance with the agreement. I, I don't do that. I don't rubber stamp. I go through every single paragraph and make sure that I'm satisfied with it because I don't know. And especially in situations where I've seen these red flags, where there's a power imbalance, where there may be all sorts of things going on. I, I won't just rubber stamp a consent because somebody signed it. I need to make sure that it makes sense. They always, they always have, and I've said many times, um, they have the option of withdrawing and sorting it out on their own, but they weren't able to. They've come to court. And so I have a responsibility and I, and I take it seriously. And I think that helps to mitigate against some of that coercion um, and people being forced into situations or signing things or agreeing to things. A common one is child support. You know, child support in Ontario, Canada is the right of the child. It's the right of the child. And I think that's appropriate because you don't want to put another parent who is the victim of family violence in a position to bargain that away 
by virtue of just wanting peace and wanting some some for things to end and wanting to be able to just move on uh, with their lives and, and parenting their children puts them in an awful position. That's not uh, a position from which to bargain. The I talked about the integrated family violence. I mean that the integrated domestic violence court. That's not common, so I don't know how helpful that is, but it, it's a very good tool because there's a different, um, there's a, as the kids say, there's a different vibe in that courtroom. We all know what the charges are. We all know what the allegations are. And you have the criminal lawyer, defense lawyers there. We also have the crown prosecutor uh, and everybody understands that those allegations, even though they're not yet proven, and they may never be proven on a criminal standard, which is beyond a reasonable doubt, and family court is on a balance of probabilities. So the simple fact that there are criminal charges and you're in this integrated domestic violence court tells me I have to sit up and I have to deal with this differently because even the fact of the allegations creates conflict, adds to conflict, adds to the, to, you know, to, to the mess that then is going to impact the children. And I think those are those are those are my comments. I leave the rest to your questions. Great. Thank you very much uh, for your comments, and I'm, I'm sure, as you can see, we have uh, lots of questions and comments coming in. So uh, if we get Jared back on and uh, Professor Gutkowski, there's so many questions. Let me let me just start with uh, with one question that that we've seen repeatedly. And Jared, I'll start with with you on this. Get a Get the uh, the voice, no longer the voice of the child, the voice of the young adult. A, a, a question is: We're all here really to help kids. I mean, that's why most of us do the work we do, and and obviously, we don't always succeed. Looking back, uh, are there critical things that could have been said and done uh, that that might have made a difference, just from a from a child's perspective? All right. Um, well, people don't know who are listening uh but i i work with about 20 to 30 other youth off and on who've gone through similar situations i i've seen a lot of your thank you so much for the support i've seen a lot of uh the links in the comments and stuff and i'm gonna try my best to check some of them out um but i am quite busy i am like i'm involved with a lot of other youth who go through something who have been through similar stories and sometimes arguably much worse stories than mine to be honest um and there's there's such vast differences between all of our stories even though they are similar and it's really hard to give any sort of answer to that because there are people or there are youth for example who never wanted to be involved never wanted to have their voices heard just wanted to be kept out of it etc and then there are people like me who wanted to be put on the stand and cross-examine like that really um it, it it comes down to trying to find some way, not just supporting youth, um, but having some way to actually include them or have them heard. That's such a such a bland answer, but there's already a lot of work being done for this and a lot of progress that has been made over the past couple of years that I've been involved with, too. But really um, getting the most amount of people knowing about it getting some more voices out there heard and trying to find a way to incorporate some youth voice early on if they want that. Again, it's if they want that. Not everyone does. So Jared, I, part of I think one of the stories you shared is, is about you know being able to have a voice in court even though it wasn't asked for and then looking forward to having a follow-up opportunity to share your, your story. So uh, I think you, you shared before that that's sort of one thing that could be critical, making sure that kids have a voice in court. Let me just ask Professor Bell, I know that you've written on that and you've been cited in a number of legal cases. Uh, what do you are in terms of making sure we have kids' voices within these kinds of proceedings? So so thank you. And, and like uh, the judge, I hadn't heard Jared's story before. And like many, I'm sure, found it very moving, both moving and disconcerting. Um, and I think, you know, two lessons I would take. One is, uh, um, and this was already mentioned, certainly having single judge case management, which uh, is not everywhere. In fact, it's, it's typically not in British Columbia, um, although 
I should say it's something that, that uh, there is research about the value of it, uh, the human value, the economic value. So something we'd really like to work towards, including in parts of Ontario, while the uh, Ontario Court of Justice has in Toronto, there are many parts of Ontario where we don't have it. And, and speaking directly to the question of the voice of the child, and again, Jared was incredibly thoughtful and articulate. Um, there is a lot of research as well that sort of supports the, the importance of hearing from children, hearing their voice um, in different ways at different stages in the process. Um, so one thing is hearing directly from children. So what we can call judicial interviews, meeting judges, meeting children. Um, which is something that is certainly being discussed much more. For example, it happens very regularly in Quebec, less so elsewhere, but I know, you know some of the comments deal with judicial education. One of the issues that is coming up in judicial education programs across Canada is trying to ensure that views are, are received by the court, including giving children the choice of meeting with a judge, um, let's say starting about the age of seven. And I think I think a really important point, which is children should have the opportunity if they want it. Some children at some points feel there's too much stress and they'd rather not meet the judge. And that's great. And of course, children, uh, we have voice of the child or hear the child reports, uh, which we're starting to use in Ontario, the Office of the Children's Lawyers starting to prepare them. Um, there are some resources in British Columbia uh, for preparing those reports, someone meeting with the child and writing down what they have to say and, and communicating that to the court and to the parents. Um, sometimes, you know, parents don't really know what their children think or feel and hearing from a neutral party, whether it's a social worker, a psychologist, or the judge can be very helpful. There's also a role for lawyers for children, um, which is something we're starting to see uh, in, in various places um, in Canada. So there, it's certainly something that is being discussed in British Columbia. The representative of children and youth is writing a report about child participation. Uh, I don't know if Jared has met with her and his uh, colleagues have met with her, but they're certainly reaching out to youth to try to change the family justice system um, in, well, in British Columbia and across Canada. Thank you for that. I guess one of the, uh, one of the themes I see coming up in the questions is how do you actually prove litigation abuse? I mean, when you, I mean, I think we have a quote in our discussion paper, you know, I'll know it when I see it, um, but that's obviously not, you know, may not be good enough. Um, Professor Kukowski, you just maybe ask you then, Justice Sirbar, like, do you think we're at the point of, if you were assessing someone in this situation, are we at the point where litigation abuse scale would, be able to be presented as part of an assessment or like how would you how do you go about proving your your case in the, the situation so in my court so many people are self-represented so i i i hesitate only because i think it's important to find a way that people can bring this information to the court's attention without a overly uh intellectualized or analytical tool um i think that that would be good for education for lawyers and for judges and for other people in the industry, but for litigants themselves, particularly those representing themselves, um, it, I think you bring your concern to the judge and don't worry about what it's called, right? So, and it can, it, because it's always going to come down to fairness. And so, for example, if you have somebody who's, that happened uh, yesterday, who's repeatedly not ready for conferences, you but they say they want dates as soon as possible. They're always demanding about timelines and when we come back, but then they're never ready and you had to take time off work. So you just raise that exactly as like that. And it isn't fair in the context of fairness. And then you particularize, yes, there's the whole issue of costs and you can ask to be indemnified and should it be full or partial? It doesn't even need to, at least in family court, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You say, I make X dollars a day, I took a day off. I took a vacation day. I'm losing a vacation day and nothing got done. You tie the uh, pay stub. And then, so, so from my perspective, given the population in my court, I'd say just call it what it is. Mm -hmm. It's unfair. Uh, he, or, or a bully. And this is what I think is, is bullying behavior. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Kukowski, do you have, do you have thoughts about, uh, about representing people or how to, to what extent we need to quantify what this is? I, I guess hearing from the judge, I guess the judge's comments is actually call out the behaviors as you've seen them. I took the day off work to come here mm -hmm. rather than putting a label. I think we, we put a label on it because we want to capture sort of a, a new phenomenon. I mean, it's old, but we're recognizing any thoughts about using the label or just describing what it is? Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges that I found when talking to mothers who had been victimized in this way is that this often goes undetected and often course of control and those dynamics are not seen. Um, and so when I think about identifying and assessing for litigation abuse, I think about situating it, anchoring it within the broader pattern of behaviors in the relationship. Right. And so thinking about other abusive behaviors that manifested within this relationship. So I think that's that's critical. I think so that's probably part of the title of this webinar is looking at it in the context of coercive control that may have taken place during the relationship. Um, Professor Bell, a lot of people asking questions about um, you know, what are the what are the things that you can actually do in, in having in having recognized litigation abuse. What are the practical strategies in terms of looking for a remedy? Um, One of the sets of questions that's being raised is um, how do you prove that litigation abuse has occurred? Or for that matter, how do you prove that course of control is going on or that or or that even that there's been physical violence? And um, and the second question is what does one conclude from those facts if they're proven? Um, and depending on where one is in the process and what kind of process one is going through, um, there may be real issues about proving what in fact happened. So, uh, and, and just Sirvar pointed out, of course, many litigants are self-represented in courts, in family courts. How is that brought for, how, what kind of, how can they bring forward evidence? How can those who work with them support them in bringing forward evidence? Um, is there evidence from police, from doctors, nurses, teachers, uh, anyone who can support the allegation and recognizing, and we now have in, in Canada, the courts, as they say, of certain aspects of family violence, the difficulties of proof, the effects of violence on children, the effects of conflict on children. So trying to get that before the court. I think uh, Justice Sarah has been very helpful and, and um, I should say um, I am have huge respect for her. It's, it's important, uh, I think everyone listening today must have that not all judges necessarily have the same level of um, understanding of some of the issues. I think she was very modest to point out she practiced family law for many years. She's been a judge for quite a few years. Um, so certainly trying to, depending on the context uh, uh, hope that the judge is educated, um, bringing forward, uh, depending on the judge's attitude towards so-called judicial notice, bring forward materials like the materials that the that that your senator Peter, the brief fourteen, for example, has about this, um, about the effects of course of control and litigation abuse on victims and. On is I think very important. Uh, so it's an ongoing, I think it's an ongoing uh, process. I mean, one of the things that I find in as, as difficult as it is to hear Jared's stories and other stories is to recognize that we've actually seen progress on some of these issues, including on family violence in, in significant part because of the work of many of those who are listening, including Peter, um, to recognize the effects of family violence and um, have some reduction in the extent of family violence in Canada. But there's uh, still a great deal to do. And that's why I think, you know, talking about the issues, alerting um, in this context professionals uh, but not just lawyers and judges, but also social workers, domestic violence workers, shelter workers. Can you help the victim to understand what is going on? So it was, you know, for as, as Peter I'm sure, and so perhaps some others of our age who recognize that at some points, um, family violence, domestic violence, domestic abuse was not recognized, not even spoken about unless it would result in an extremely serious physical injuries well documented. I think we have a 
a better understanding of the justice system and the legislative reform that we're seeing is, is giving a better understanding um, to it. So it's an ongoing, ongoing process. Do you mind if I, do you mind if I mention something? Go ahead, Jerry. Okay, I know we're running out of time here. Um, it it, it kind of has to do with my first question, but it also has to do, I know uh, Professor Bala was talking a little bit about uh, judges and how not all of them like know as much and et cetera. And I'm also seeing some stuff in the chat, not gonna mention any names, but just gonna say that um, there is some anger towards a lot of judges. And when I was going through like my story, for example, I when it, when it all first happened, I had an overwhelming amount of anger for some of the judges and what happened. And then I actually started working with judges more recent within like the past five years. And I realized that judges a lot of the time are just as upset about a lot of these things as we are, and they're just as angry about it when they know about it. Uh, and a lot of them simply don't have time, don't have, like, they, they're so overwhelmed, the, the system overwhelms them. And like my judge, for example, she she didn't have time to know my entire family's legal history. There was no, like, support for her to even find out anything about it. Like, it's a much broader issue than, like, any sort of power imbalance between that is an issue, but it's much broader than that. And one of the things, going back to my original question, yes, um, more opportunities for youth to take part um, and uh, more, um, what, what was one of the other things? Sorry, I'm blanking here, <laughs> but more opportunities for youth. Oh, one judge, one judge, one case, that sort of thing. But part of the problem with one judge, one case for a lot of judges is that they like there's too many cases uh they, like the, there can't always be one judge for one case and something that is being worked on right now is to try and find a way to give people who are going into court resources to know about uh other options uh other than court because a lot of people right now they're getting funneled into the court system based off of other work that i've done and they're not given they're not given knowledge about other things they can do besides just straight on full-on litigation and there are a lot of lawyers out there also so you get a client out of this, not saying they're all like that by any means, but there, that is a problem as well. A lot of people are getting pushed into litigation. It's overwhelming the system. It's overwhelming judges, it's overwhelming people, it's overwhelming lawyers, et cetera. So there is something to be said about trying to find ways to not funnel people straight into litigation and give them other opportunities as well. Uh, that could be a big help for other, other issues going on. Yeah, if I could just uh, comment and, and thank Jared again. Uh, one of the things that uh, many people, myself included, are working on is trying to involve children in mediation. So I think, uh, you know, keeping people out of the courts, getting people to settle at conferences or otherwise. I think that just sort of pointed out that she, more cases are settled by the people as a result of her working with them at conferences than as a result of going to trial, which is good, which is necessary. Um, and I think the other thing you you point out, I think that uh, Justice Servar, just the way she speaks points out, um, how hard, um, I think, you know, in this country, uh, frankly, in, in Canada, I think compared to many other countries, we're very fortunate in the, the judges that we have who are very dedicated, very dedicated, uh, and actually knowledgeable often. And, and you pointed out really that it's a systemic issue as opposed to, you know, and it's understandable that if someone, whether they're a child or a parent, went in front of a judge and didn't get the outcome that they wanted, or even the, the, the outcome that was in the best interest of the child, um, will feel anger towards that judge. But the judge may have been a, effectively constrained or even a prisoner of the system to say, well, you know, this is what I had in front of me that day. It's a good question why, you know, I didn't have more information, but that's all I had. And given that, I made the decision, the best decision that I could in that particular context. But I certainly, we certainly have judges, you know, working not only in individual cases, but also towards law reform. You know, when you mentioned you and Jared probably knows Donna Martinson, who is a retired judge in British Columbia. Who, you know, she's a huge advocate of uh, one family, one judge, and she writes about it and speaks about it. So I think our judges are in this country. We're, we're on the whole very fortunate with the judiciary that we have. Judge Server, we would uh, ask you for any final reflections just on the one point that Jared has raised is. You know, being going to court and having multiple judges, some who read the file and some who have, and, you know, sometimes just because of the volume of, could be the volume of, of work, but that's sort of a common frustration. I know you're not responsible for the whole system. You're doing the very best job you can as an individual judge. No, and 
Do you have any reflections about it, you know, about that well, issue and how we can better address it? I, at, in our court, it's one judge, single judge case managed, and it's a family court judge. Um, and so I know everything that happens on every one of my files. I know them by name. I know children's, you know, the circumstances. I keep really detailed notes because that's sort of the magic, right? That's the whole point that you're not starting from scratch, that you can intervene, that you can mitigate some of the negative consequences. One tip that, two practical tips I just wanted to give that I forgot to mention was one, the issue of constantly bringing motions and proceedings. I regularly make orders that parties aren't allowed to bring any further motions without leave of the court. So they, and the other party doesn't have to respond. So they simply file a procedural motion, which we call a 14B motion that I deal with in chambers, setting out why it's different and why they should be allowed. That manages um, a lot. The other piece is Office of the Children's Lawyer getting either a social worker to do an investigation or a lawyer to make submissions on behalf of the child. So the child doesn't have to be in the middle. Some children are like Jared was, and they have a maturity and an awareness and, and can articulate. Other kids, and I know this from being a children's lawyer myself, that would just crush them. They just would tell me, I, I don't want you to tell them what I said. I want the grownups to decide. Like this too much for them. So a lawyer for the child allows for them to be heard, but then it can also create a buffer. So parties can ask for that. Those are really important points. Um, I noticed that our, our time is coming to an end and I, I, I think we've just sort of opened the door on this discussion. We're obviously gonna have to have a number of follow-up webinars and Professor Kukowski, you're gonna have to do a lot more research. Uh, yeah, same thing with uh, Professor Bell and myself, just to keep up, because there's obviously a lot of interest in trying to articulate this and really uh, make sure we do early intervention and prevention when, when we see these patterns happening. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the presenters. Uh, Justice Servar, you give us all a sense of hope, and it's so great not that uh, we shouldn't have that with all our judges, but obviously your, you know, your compassion and your care really comes out very clearly, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come and present. Uh, Professor Gukowski, thank you very much for your uh, the research uh, that you're doing, and, and hopefully uh, we're we'll looking forward to all your follow-up studies uh, as you uh, we understand more. Um, Professor Bala, thank you very much for your ongoing work and contribution to this webinar and, and many others, and I know we always uh, learn a lot working together with you over the years. And Jared, uh, I think uh, as you did in Quebec City, I think you've stolen the show again in this webinar with, uh, I think your passion, uh, you can see from the chat function that so many people are in similar circumstances, some just beginning and some uh, near the end who can identify so strongly with your, your words. So um, I'm not sure what negative things you ever say to yourself, but if you ever do also say to yourself, you're you have such a strong voice and you're such an amazing advocate and we hope you uh, continue this work and help other young people thank you all for for attending uh, when you sign off uh, on this webinar you'll be given a brief survey uh, about uh, about what you thought about the webinar and then you'll be given a certificate of attendance that you make that you could use for your professional association or body again thank you all very much for attending Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye.